Good afternoon. I have to say, I've never walked into a countdown on a screen before. A new experience. So thank you for being here and coming to explore two significant pieces composed for the organ in the middle of a 19th century. The Prelude and Fugue on B-A-C-H by Franz Liszt and the Sonata on the 94th Psalm by Julius Roibka. The music that I will be playing and discussing ushered in a new style of organ composition, including new tonal possibilities, new genres, and new attitudes about the organ as an instrument. Let's get started with our journey. Franz Liszt is perhaps most, most remembered as a virtuoso and prolific composer for the piano. Although his body of large-scale organ works is quite small, three to be exact, these pieces broke new ground and influenced his students, as well as composers and organ builders in Germany and beyond. Among Liszt's most gifted students was Julius Roibka, Although Roibka did not live long enough to enjoy the success and fame like that of his teacher, he is now remembered and held in high esteem as being a creator, the creator of one of the greatest masterpieces in the organ repertory. To truly understand the significance of the music that you'll be hearing today, we will begin by taking a look at the organ and its music prior to the 19th century. After the death of Johann Sebastian Bach in 1750, the output of new compositions for the organ declined sharply. Musical tastes were shifting away from church music and moving toward a light, courtly style of composition. This melodically driven music was replacing the earlier polyphonic style, climaxing with the profound and complex works of J.S. Bach. The organ built during the Baroque era the organs built during the Baroque era were voiced for clarity, enabling the listener to hear each independent part and were far less suited for the style galant that was becoming all the rage toward the end of the 18th century. During this time, the forte piano was rising in importance as the primary keyboard instrument, leaving the organ behind. Although music was still being written for the organ, it lacked the compositional quality of the piano music being composed by Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. Another contributing factor to the decline of organ composition was the rise of enlightened thinking. During this time, European culture was drifting away from the church and church music. No longer were organists a central part of the musical life of society. This sociological shift moved many organists out of the churches and into the world of secular music. A new type of organist emerged, the traveling organ virtuoso. The most notable example was Georg Joseph Vogler. Vogler was greatly influenced with the dynamic possibilities and dramatic effects of symphonic music. He viewed the organ as a large, colorful orchestra. He wasn't concerned with the Baroque organ tradition. His musical thought was influenced by crescendo possibilities as were being developed in the Mannheim School. He concertized in Germany and Paris, where his flashy improvisations became known for their spectacular psychological effect, not for their musical quality. About the same time, it was Felix Mendelssohn who was setting the standard of written organ composition for the 19th century. Mendelssohn's Preludes and Fugues and his Six Organ Sonatas, published in 1837, took advantage of the romantic style and newly emerging piano keyboard techniques. In his organ sonatas, Mendelssohn seldom used sonata allegro form, but rather chose forms reminiscent of earlier North German Baroque toccatas, with alternating chordal, fugal, and toccata sections. Mendelssohn borrowed this Baroque structure, but composed the music with the harmonic language of early Romanticism. But things were about to change in written composition for organ. In 1848, Franz Liszt settled in Weimar, a small yet important cultural center in Germany. 
Soon after his arrival there, he began to assimilate himself into the organ culture in and around the city. It was likely that his interest was sparked by living in the place where the great Johann Sebastian Bach had been employed as court organist for the Duke of Weimar. Liszt enjoyed taking trips to nearby regions to play the organs that Bach and his contemporaries had played. On one such trip, Alexander Wilhelm Gottschlag, who was an organist friend of Liszt, recounts his experience. He says, Liszt usually gave the man who operated the organ bellows one thaller for his work in order that I could hear how a Bach fugue should sound. He would reach over my shoulders and to play the manuals while I would play the pedals because he had no great fluency on them. Since he usually took Tempe very fast, it was often an effort to keep up with him. Shortly after Liszt's arrival in Weimar, he completed his piano transcription of six of Bach's organ preludes and fugues. As Liszt transferred the pieces written for several manuals and pedals to the single keyboard of the piano, his knowledge about the very nature of the organ grew. It wasn't long until Liszt was composing his own music for the organ. Liszt's organ works departed from the Mendelssohn model, utilizing new forms, including the one movement sonata, more adventurous harmonies, and much more virtuosity. Liszt also broke from the notion that the organ was an instrument of the church. His treatment of the organ could be related to the revolutionary practices of the improvisations of Vogler, but moving them from a non-written form to an actual musical score. In 1850, Liszt completed the first of his three large-scale organ works. The enormous Ad Nos Ad Saluntarum Undam was considered to be the first symphonic organ work due to its length and dramatic use of dynamics. This set the stage, so to speak, for César Franck's extraordinary piece, the Grande Pièce Symphonique, which then served as the model for later French organ symphonies, such as those by Vidor and Vierne. After the success of Odnos, Liszt was commissioned to compose a brand new piece for the inaugural concert of the newly constructed organ in the, or in the Cathedral of Merseburg, which was the largest organ in all of Europe at that time. The organ was rebuilt by Friedrich Ladgast, who was the son of a carpenter and a cabinet maker. He had studied in various organ workshops, including one in Leipzig, Strasbourg, and in the famous workshop of Cavaille Cole in Paris. The reconstruction of the organ in the Merseburg Cathedral was completed in 1855. The inaugural concert, scheduled for September 27th of that year, was to feature Liszt's commissioned piece. But Liszt was unable to begin his work until the of the commissioned piece until late in August. As time ran out, he went to plan B. He asked Alexander Wittenberger, who was his student and organist and the organist at the Merseburg Cathedral, he asked him to play his sonata on Odnos instead. Winterberger's performance met with great enthusiasm for the, from the community and the music critics. In the months that followed, Liszt completed his prelude and fugue on B-A-C-H, which was noted for its monothematic construction and virtuoso style. Alexander Wittenberger gave the premier performance of this work on May the 13th of 1856. His performance was given highest praise with the author of the review agreeing with a statement made by Franz Liszt saying that Alex Winterberger plays with his feet better than others play with their hands. Liszt paid tribute to J.S. Bach by basing the entire work on the four letters of his name. Both the prelude and fugue are based on a succession of notes, B flat, A, C, and B natural, which is the musical spelling of the name Bach. 
In the German system, the B flat is actually given the name B, and the B natural is given the name H. So I invite you to look up at the screens for our first musical example. In the opening of the prelude, the B-A-C-H motive is heard first in the pedal. After a sequence of manual figures, Liszt returns to the B-A-C-H theme, placing it on the top note of the arpeggios and bottom note of the left hand. These figures are primarily built upon the diminished seventh chord. I'll head up to the organ to play the next few examples. In the next example, it demonstrates a short pedal cadenza based on the BACH theme. You can see and hear how Liszt uses the theme as a point of departure. In the third example, Liszt presents the theme in the lowest voice and a transposition of the motive in the upper voice of the chords. The Bach theme continues in the fugue the subject of the fugue consists of two parts, a head and a tail. The head consists of the BACH theme, and the tail consists of eighth notes, each with a half step followed by the leap of a tritone. The fugue subject uses 10 of the, ten, ten of the 12 chromatic pitches. There are not quite enough notes to create a 12-tone row, but it is a stepping stone to the development of serialism as realized by Arnold Schoenberg in the 20th century. The counter subject is made up of a chromatically descending line of eighth notes and is an important compositional device through the remainder of the piece. We first hear the Bach motive and then the head of the subject begins. Mm -hmm. As the fugue progresses, more statements of the subject head appear in octaves, divided between manuals and pedals, 
leading to an extended rhapsodic section characterized by downward sweeping scales and subject head statements in both manual and pedal parts. This is a union of virtuosity and thematic development here in the, the fugue. In the next section, this presents the fugue subject in augmentation, accompanied by staccato scalar material derived from the counter subject and the theme tail. In the final section, a trill begins to relax into the theme head and tail statements that are presented in augmentation and clearly end back in B flat major. And for the final display of German romanticism, Liszt chooses two drastically opposing dynamic levels in the final bars of this piece, which you'll hear in about 15 minutes as I play Franz Liszt's Prelude and Fugue on BACH. I hope that you will enjoy this remarkable work performed today on this magnificent 77 rank Gladder gets Rosales pipe organ.
Welcome back. Let's continue on to another monumental work from the mid-19th century, the Sonata on the 94th Psalm by Julius Roibke. Roibke was born in Germany on, in 1834. He was the son of an organ builder. Young Roibke received his early musical training in Quedlingburg, located a little northwest of Leipzig. There, he studied composition, piano, and organ. By the time he was about 17, he had become a proficient organist and entered the newly founded Berlin Conservatory, where he studied composition and piano. As a student at the conservatory, Roibke became friends with the organist Alexander Wittenberger, who was the virtuoso with the fast feet that I mentioned earlier. Upon graduation, Roibke was awarded high honors, and it is said that the famous conductor and pianist, Hans von Bülow, considered him the conservatory's most gifted student. After teaching for a short period at the conservatory, Roibke moved to Weimar, where he soon became one of Liszt's favorite pupils. Upon his arrival in Weimar, Roibke was immersed to, it was immersed in music composed in a progressive style. This style included new musical genres, as well as innovations in harmonic language that Liszt and others were exploring. You just heard one such piece. This chromatic and tonally adventurous design became known as the New German School. The fathers of this school were Liszt, Wagner and Berlioz. But it is primarily Liszt who had contact with many young composers and performers who made up this group. In spite of limited resources and the surrounding controversy between the progressives and the traditionalists, Liszt made Weimar a center for the performance of new music. Many of these innovations created the means to explore poetic ideas. Although the new German school was losing its identity by the 1870s, the genre of the symphonic poem and the extended chromatic harmony soon became integral parts of modern music, leading musical development into the 20th century. 1857 was a tremendous year of cre creative output for the 24-year-old Roivka. He composed both his sonata in B minor for piano and the sonata on the 94th Psalm for organ. The organ sonata was premiered by the composer himself on the Ladegast organ in Merseburg Cathedral in June of that year. Both the piano and organ works were highly praised by members of the Weimar Circle. Music critic Franz Brendel wrote, the performance of Mr. Roibka was outstanding. Presently, he lives in Weimar as a student of Liszt. After the performance of his sonata, there can be no doubt of his decisive outstanding capability as a composer and as a performer. Distinguishing are the wealth of imagination and the great freshness of invention. I think you'll really hear that fresh invention on the piece that I'll be playing in a few min minutes. At the end of that year, Roibka moved to Dresden. His failing health forced him to retire from his concert artist career and in May, he moved to the nearby town of Pilnitz, where he hoped he would find relief for his ailing lung. Sadly, he died on June 3rd, being only 24 years of age. Roibke's Sonata on the 94th Psalm is a masterpiece in the German Romantic tradition. It reflects a mature and logical evolution from what had come before him. Freud could utilize the one movement sonata, just like that of Liszt's fantasy and fugue on Odnos. 
the form for the 94th Psalm that Roybka chose is known as cyclical, whereby thematic material is utilized and transformed throughout a musical piece. Perhaps he was inspired by Hector Berlioz's symphonic work, Symphonie Fantastique, that utilized the same cyclical form. But the premiere of Liszt's Prelude and Fugue on BACH, the year before Roybka's Sonata was written, surely influenced the young composer. Both composers chose a theme on which to base their respective works. Roybka's theme is longer and more complex than the four-note theme of Liszt, but both composers found ingenious ways to develop their themes throughout their respective works. Other commonalities include the abundance of diminished seventh chords and virtuosic passages, as well as heavy helpings of chromaticism. Broibka's compositional style is disciplined and clear, not just technical and flashy, but rather the technical character is part of its substance and essence. It could be argued that Roybka's fully mature organ sonata contains greater depth and more profound spirit than the organ works from the pen of his teacher in Weimar. Roybka based his sonata on a religious text, which is taken from the Book of Psalms. Psalm 94 is a prayer asking God to defend his people and take vengeance upon the wicked and oppressors of the world. It has been considered that Roybka used this text as a protest against social injustice. The first edition of the sonata edited by his brother, Otto Roybka, was published in Leipzig in 1871, which was 13 years after Julius's death. In that edition, it contains specific passages from the 94th Psalm and their connection to various musical sections. In each of these sections, Roybka transformed the musical language, text into a musical language. The entire sonata is built on a four measure theme, beginning with a rhythmically and melodically jagged opening, followed by a steady descending chromatic scale fragment. As in the Liszt piece, Roybka transposes the theme, inverts the theme, presents it in augmentation, and utilizes rhythmic fragments. An important one is the dotted eighth note and sixteenth note. The first edition, the first section marked Grave Larghetto, is based on Psalm 94, the first two verses. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Arise, thou judge of the world, and reward the proud after their deserving. As the sonata opens, we hear the theme of the work played in the pedals. The first part of the theme, or theme head, reveals a rhythmically and melodically jagged construction followed by a rhythmically steady, chromatically descending line. The theme is then repeated on the, on the manuals. Then the theme is transposed down a half step 
and presented in the manuals. Roybka begins his thematic transformation in the Larghetto. This theme is harder to distinguish than the earlier presentation, but contains elements of both the head and tail of the theme. A rhythmically altered version is presented in the lowest voice in the next example. The following example begins at the allegro con fuoco, which means quickly with fire. The flame is ignited with the rugged and jagged construction of the theme head with the energy of the dotted rhythm and chromatic passages driving the intensity into the development section. It's based on verses three, six, and seven. Lord, how long shall the ungodly triumph? They murder the widow, the stranger, and put the fatherless to death. And yet they say, hush, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. next section. The theme is developed and transposed into new tonal areas and is accompanied by arpeggiated diminished seventh chords. In the adagio, the theme is presented in the top voice of the descending portal progression. This section is based on verses 17 and 19. If the Lord had not helped me, it had not failed, but my soul had been put to silence in the multitude of the sorrows that I had in my heart. Thy comforts have refreshed my soul. The sonata concludes with a vigorous fugue divided into two sections. 
It is based on these words. But the Lord is my refuge, and my God is the strength of my confidence. He shall recompense them for their wickedness and destroy them in their own malice. The fugue subject is based on the head and inverted tail of the theme, and the counter subject is based on the diminished seventh chord. As the theme develops, Roybka presents the theme in a different way, many different ways, in fact. In the next example, the theme head is presented in the top voices. The descending chromatic scale tail is heard in the pedal and left hand, and the jagged dotted rhythm is heard in the right hand, which then modulates upwards. In the final example, we hear the start of the exhilarating thrust to the end. It begins with a clear statement of the theme, accompanied by triplets, giving way to an even more dramatic statement of the theme, heard this afternoon on the trumpet on Shemad's. So I thank you for your attention, and I now would like to, you to immerse yourself in the beauty and the drama and the triumph of Roybka's 94th Psalm. <laughs>